Good morning, it's Pastor Ron, and I'm so glad to be with you. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, you're always glad to be with the family of faith. And you're right if you're thinking that. There's something just very special about coming together and spending time in the Word. Something very special about coming together and being able to pray and being able to sing and be able to be thankful for all that God has done for us. And today, being Palm Sunday, we're going to be talking about something that Jesus has done for us that we dare never forget because Jesus made his way into Jerusalem, not just for the other people of the world, but for you and me. And we've got a response that we need to come up with when it comes to something Christ has done for us that's so potent. And the response I pray that the Lord will place in our hearts collectively is this. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord, come what may. Here I am, Lord. Well, let's see what Jesus did. And let's see if the Lord says the same thing to you that he said to me. That our response should be willingly, here I am, Lord. I'm ready. I'm ready for whatever you place before me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're a great God, a holy God. And Father, we thank you, Lord, that you loved us enough to come to this sin-scarred earth. Father, we thank you that you allowed yourself to be tempted and tried in all ways just like us. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you not only came to this earth, but you came to the city of Jerusalem when you knew what would happen when you came there. Father, we thank you that no one and nothing held you back you didn't slow down, you moved forward. You recognized the price that you would pay would be great, but you recognized, Lord, that it was the only way we could have salvation. May we find our worth in you. May we find our definition in you. May we be thankful forever for what you've done for us. And may we not just receive this gift that cost you so much, so, so easily. May we, Lord, respond to it with the right response, saying back to you, Whatever it takes, whatever is necessary, may I be here for you too. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, today is Palm Sunday, and amen to that. It is the day we commemorate the Lord's triumphal entrance into the city of Jerusalem. What a day that must have been. The Bible tells us when talking about it that people cut down palm branches and they put them down on the streets before the Lord. When that didn't seem to be adequate, they took off some of their coats and they put those on top of the palm branches. And as they gathered together to not just look at him, but to hear his words, they started to shout out for all to hear, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now the word Hosanna is a wonderful biblical word. It's a call for deliverance. If you were to get a biblical dictionary and you would look it up, it would mean save us now. It would mean save us, we pray. This was a time of true celebration. It was a time of great joy. It was a time of great hope. It was a time of expectation and praise. There's no doubt about it. But Jesus knew because he knows all things that many of the very ones who had gathered together that day and were shouting out at the top of their lungs, Hosanna, Hosanna to the King of the Highest, would soon move from yelling, Hail Him, to quickly shouting out, Nail Him. And as I pondered what took place that day, between the triumphal entry of our Lord to the following Friday, I was drawn to just one verse. One verse. One verse just kept on coming back to my mind. One verse just kept on coming back to my heart. One verse just kept on coming back to my spirit that the Lord led me to share with you. And it's Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Let's look at it together. Luke, the historian. Luke, the medical doctor. Luke, the one who wrote the Gospel of Luke, wrote these words as he was moved of the Holy Spirit, as the time approached for him, this is the Lord, to come up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. To be resolute means that you don't let anyone or anything hold you back. You keep on going, come what may. What a powerful proclamation. Jesus knew exactly what would take place when he was heading his way into Jerusalem. And let me tell you what he did. He stared it all down. Jesus stared down the loneliness that came to him on that particular journey. He knew that many of his closest friends would run off and others would follow him, but they would follow him at a great distance. Jesus stared down the humiliation that he knew that was coming his way. He knew that when he entered into the city of Jerusalem, it wouldn't be long before he was mocked and then stripped of what meager possessions he 
he did have. Jesus stared down physical torture that he knew was coming his way, all the pain, all the agony, all the strain. Most of all, what did Jesus do? He, stored, he stared down sin. The Bible puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Ooh, I love that passage. Some Bible verses put it this way, some translations. He who knew no sin, he who never sinned, became sin for us. Why? So we could be forgiven and we could be restored. Therefore, the pressing question that the Lord placed in my heart to share with you is this. Jesus died for us. Are we willing to live for him? We hear that again. Jesus willingly died for us. Are we willingly to live for for him will we live for him come what may do we have not only lips that say we're going to live for him but we have a life that says here i am lord here i am that's the title of this particular message and it's the message that the lord has placed within my heart to share with you today are we saying back to the lord in response to all he's done for us here i am lord well, I love reading all the Gospels, and I especially love the Gospel of Luke. Don't misunderstand, I appreciate Matthew's presentation as Jesus as King. It's inspiring to read Mark's presentation of Jesus the Servant, and John's presentation of Jesus as the only begotten Son of God is a very, very, very special book. But my heart finds a very special blessing in the Gospel of Luke, and I'll tell you why. Because Luke introduces us not just to crowds of people, but Luke introduces us to individual people. It's the Gospel that presents more fully the compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luke contains a story about a journey took that Jesus took a long time ago, a journey to the cross. Interestingly, if you read Luke's gospel, you'll see that nearly half of it is devoted to covering Jesus' last journey to the city of Jerusalem. And make no mistake about it, Jesus knew why he was going there. Jesus had a purpose for every single thing that he did. One day, Jesus was with the apostles. And when he was with the apostles, he said these words. He said, I have a need to travel to Samaria. Now, the Samaritans and the Jewish people didn't get along very well. They didn't have much interaction. They stayed away from each other. It was a, there was a gap between them. Yet Jesus said what? He said, I have a need to travel through the city of Jerusalem, to travel through the city of Samaria. Now, why did he want to go there? He wanted to go there to speak to a woman at a well whose life had been broken by sin. She was so ashamed that she went to the well in the middle of the day when no one else would come by. She was a woman who had no one speak to her. She was a woman who had made immoral choices in her life and she had a very reckless past. But in response to her need, what did Jesus say? He said, I have a need to travel through to Samaria. Why? Because he wanted to meet with this woman. He had a purpose for each and every single thing that he did. At another point, Jesus purposely waited for three days before he went to the town of Bethany. Why? So that he could show the power of God by raising Lazarus, not simply from illness, but raising Lazarus from the dead. And then there was the time that the Lord told the apostles to get into a boat and cross over the Sea of Galilee. And why did they do that? Because he knew they would pass through a storm. And when they went through this storm, they would learn about the importance of placing their trust in him completely. So when we open up our Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, and we turn to chapter 9. It's important to remember that Jesus had a purpose for every single thing he did. He knew why he was going to Jerusalem. He was going to Jerusalem to die. Hold that in your mind. Hold that in your heart. Hold that in your spirit as you one more time hear Luke chapter 9, verse 51. As the time approached for him, this is the Lord, to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely. That means he made a, a resolve. He wasn't going backwards. He wasn't going to the left. He wasn't going to the right. He was going forward. He resolutely did what? He set out for Jerusalem. He would let nothing, absolutely nothing or no one, keep him from making this journey. 
This is such a powerful verse. I feel the need to share it with you, not only in the NIV, but also in the ESV and in the King James Version. Listen to Luke 9.51 in the ESV. When the days drew near for him, Jesus, to be taken up, he set his face. He stared it down to go to Jerusalem. The King James Version puts it this way. And it came to pass when the time came for him, for Jesus, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set or firmly fixed, if you will, his face to go towards Jerusalem. Now don't pass over those words too quickly. When talking about our Lord's journey to Jerusalem, the NIV said what? It said he resolutely set out for the city of Jerusalem. The ESV puts it this way, that he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And the King James Bible says that he steadfastly or firmly fixed his face to go to Jerusalem. These are all intentional words. And those words should not surprise us at all. From the beginning of Jesus' earthly life, he was always controlled by a master purpose. At at the age of 12, when Mary and Joseph couldn't find him after they spent some time in the temple and they frantically looked for him, and when they finally did discover where he was and they talked to him about where he had been and why he hadn't been with them, do you remember what he said? He said, I must be about my father's business. And then there came the time when Jesus came down to the Jordan River to be baptized and to begin his earthly ministry. When he did, John the Baptist loudly proclaimed for all to hear, Behold, that word means pay close attention. Behold, pay close attention. The Lamb of God, he's pointing to Jesus, which takes away the sins of the world. And what about the time that Jesus was with Nicodemus and he said these words, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man, me, be lifted up. What was he telling the people? He was telling the people that one day he not only would come to this world, he would die in this world for us, for you, for me, for the people of the world. Jesus knew why he was going to Jerusalem. He knew it wasn't to see the holy sites in the city. He knew it wasn't to go to a religious festival. Jesus made his way to the city of Jerusalem to be a sacrifice for sins. He was going to Jerusalem to die for your sins and for my sins and the sins of the entire world. Yet when you read the Gospels, doesn't matter which one, what do you see? He never winced. He never complained. The Bible tells us, and it tells us very plainly, that he resolutely, he steadfastly set out for or set his face towards Jerusalem. And the more I contemplate this truth, the more impactful and encouraging the journey becomes. As you walk with Jesus through the pages of Luke's gospel, what do you find Jesus doing? You find him thinking about other people not about himself. Will you hear that again? As Jesus makes his way towards the cross, he's thinking about other people, not about himself. Well, let me ask you a question I've been asking myself all week, and the question is this. If I knew that I were going to die on a cruel and humiliating death on a Roman cross, what would I be thinking about? If I knew I was going someplace and I was going to be suffering a torturous death, what would I be thinking about? Isn't it fair and isn't it accurate to say most likely we'd be thinking about ourselves? And isn't also fair and accurate to say that we would not just be thinking of ourselves, we would be feeling very sorry for ourselves as well. But that was not true for Jesus. As he made his way to that last journey to Jerusalem, he paused along the way to do what? He paused along the way to teach people, to preach the gospel, to heal the sick, and to offer not only hope, but newness of life. This is the message that Luke wants us to understand. This is the message he wants us to hold near and dear to our hearts. Under the inspiration of God's Spirit, he presents to us Jesus, the compassionate, the friend of those who are in need. He is the one who never is too busy to stop, to listen, and to help us bear life's burdens. To say the least, this was not an easy journey for him to make. For the most part, what did he have to do? He had to make this journey alone. Well, yes, he traveled with the apostles most of the time. There's no doubt about it. But when you study this particular set of scriptures, what do you see? You see that some of them didn't believe he would ever die, even though he had told them about his death on many occasions. Peter, even when they took Jesus to the side and he tried to stop him from going to Jerusalem, saying, this should never happen to you. Many of the other apostles, when they started making their way to Jerusalem, they started to see how the, the waves of the crowd turned their voices from saying, hail him to nail him. What did they 
they do? They hid themselves, but what did Jesus do? Jesus resolutely, Jesus steadfastly set his face towards Jerusalem, and he kept on going, even though he knew when he got there he would not be crowned, he would be crucified. Most of the time, when we think about taking a journey, what do we think about? We think about having times of refreshment and relaxation and renewal. We look forward to getting up a little later than what we typically do when we're home. We get ready and we tell ourselves to start anticipating and seeing some very beautiful sights or being reunited with people who we love and who we really miss. Sometimes the travel that we have to take is really tough, but the destination, it makes it all worthwhile. But here in my heart, I know what you know. Not all journeys are that way. There are times in our lives when God calls us to make a journey or to do a special task that other people don't understand, that other people downplay, that other people even begin to mock. There are times when we have arguments within ourselves. There are times when we want to turn away from the goal and try to find an easier path. There are times when Jesus and following Jesus requires us to hear above the crowd and if necessary to walk absolutely alone. It's easy to quit, and it's certainly nothing new. Judas quit, Demas quit, and so have a myriad of other people. Again, there's times we in our, in and ourselves, what do we do? We argue with ourselves that we should turn away, that we should turn back, or at least look for an easier path. But Jesus never did that. What did he do? He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and nothing, no thing, held him back. Let that message sink in and treasure its reality. Our Lord went to the hardest possible place to endure the hardest possible test, death on the cross, while carrying the sins of the world. Again, this was in character for him. He never avoided the hard places of life. Think about the life of Jesus. He was born in a stable or a cave-like structure. He lived and grew up in a poor carpenter's home. Even in the height of his popularity, Jesus said these words. He says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man, he's speaking of himself, has absolutely nowhere to lay his head. Jesus refused to look for shortcuts or easy detours. He never compromised with the world, and he never compromised within himself. He walked the road to Jerusalem, and he willingly faced the cross. Can we talk? Can we talk at a deep level? Can we challenge each other in a very unique and very powerful way? You and I are called to follow his example. We are called to follow in his footsteps. We should not be satisfied with only the easiest of tasks. We should not be satisfied with carrying only the lightest of burdens or walking only on the most comfortable of roads. It's so easy to carry just enough Christian responsibility to remain having some kind of respectable testimony. But are we willing, are we truly willing to travel to Jerusalem? Are we willing to travel the Calvary Road? There's no doubt about it. At times in life, it is costly to follow Jesus. He calls us to carry a cross, not just to wear one. He calls us not just to come to church, but to be the church. He calls us not just to own a Bible, but to read a Bible, study the Word, and live the Word out. He calls us to discover what our spiritual gift is and then use them in His church to promote the kingdom. That is not an easy calling, but follow it we must. Like our Lord, we need to resolve ourselves to steadfastly set our faces towards our Jerusalem and keep on going. Maybe today you're facing a very difficult task. Your Jerusalem, your Calvary is before you, and you're saying, or at least you're thinking inside your mind and inside your heart, I can't do it. The journey is just too difficult, or at least this journey is just too difficult for me. Maybe today you're facing an illness, facing loneliness, financial troubles, family problems, or disappointments. Maybe you've been criticized and taken advantage of by those outside the kingdom. And maybe you've been burned a few times by those who are inside the kingdom. Every single life has its Jerusalem road. Every single life has its Gethsemane. Every single life has its Calvary. To deny that would be a lie. But it's equally a lie. 
to erase from our minds and heart that every faithful life will have its Easter day of resurrection, joy, and victory. Will you hear that again? Every faithful life will have its day of Easter, joy, and resurrection, and victory. I want you to get the full impact of what Luke is sharing. So go back with me again, and let's just look at that one verse we're talking about together one more time. Luke chapter 9, verse 51. Let's take it more slowly. The NIV says, As the time approached for him to be taken up to Jerusalem, or excuse me, taken up to heaven, Jesus set out for Jerusalem. Did you catch that? Before Jesus was taken up to heaven, he had to do what? He had to suffer. The Bible tells us, by his stripes we are healed. If Jesus hadn't suffered and died for our sins, there'd be no possibility of heaven for us, nor would there ever be a possibility of living an abundant life. Our Lord knew that, and he willingly paid the price for us to go to heaven, so that not only could we be there forever, but we could also have victory in this world realized. Yes, there are difficult times in this life. There are times we face disappointment. There are times we face sorrow. There are times we face frustration. But if we yield ourselves to God, drawing on His power, expressing His patience, and looking at the life through His perspective as we walk our Jerusalem road, let me tell you what will happen. We will discover that God will see us not only around, but see us through whatever may come our way. And at the end of the road, we will experience the indescribable glory of God. Hold on to that truth and celebrate that truth. But how do we best do that? How do we best show that? How do we best respond? It's when we say not only with our lips, but with our lives. Here I am, Lord. Here I am, Lord, come what may. Here I am, Lord. May we never forget that Jesus came to Jerusalem for you and for me. May we never forget he took on the toughest things that have ever been and he declared victory. And amen to that because he won. Why? Could he set his face towards Jerusalem and let nothing and no one hold him back? In response, what should our life say? Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Come what may. Here I am, Lord. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, I thank you, Lord, that you are with us and you are stronger than anyone or anything we face. We live in a world where there's lots of fear. We live in a world where there's a lot of reaction. We live in a world that's a lot of times changing and there's a lot of overwhelming. But Lord, through the power of Christ, we have the victory. Father, we thank you, Lord, that greater is the one who is in us than the one who is in the world. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we'll be done with the troubles and trials some day of life. But in the meantime, we can show the difference. We can be salt and light. We can stand up when others sit down. We can keep going when we want the, in our own human hearts to go backwards. Father, we thank you, Lord, that Jesus came to the city of Jerusalem knowing the cost. Father, we thank you. He paid the price. May we always remember, Lord, that what cost him much cannot be cheap for us. Help us to respond, Lord, by giving our life back to him, not just at the point of salvation, but at the point of dedication. So we wouldn't just be Christians, we'd be disciples, we'd be followers of Christ. Help us, Lord, to live that kind of a life. Help us, Lord, to say to him, the one who's done so much for us, here I am, Lord. I'm ready. I'm willing. I'll do whatever you call me to do. I'll be who you've called me to be. Lord, what an honorable gift that would be to give you. And what a wonderful way it would tell you how thankful we are that you resolutely, steadfastly, set your face towards Jerusalem and made your way all the way to the cross just for us. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.